bygone month, I embarked on my inaugural solitary expedition along the Appalachian Trail. During my formative years, I traversed extensively alongside my father. However, those excursions never extended beyond a half day before morphing into other endeavors or culminating with our return home. Yet for the past few years, the notion of an extended trek, encompassing days, weeks, or perhaps months, traversing the untamed expanses of the world, held an enchanting yet slightly unnerving allure. I cannot boast of exceptional athleticism or a profound affinity for the outdoors, but possessing a reasonable level of fitness and having dedicated recent months to bolstering my endurance, acquiring the necessary trailcraft expertise, and delving into the requisites of equipment, I endeavored to prepare myself. The recurring counsel I encountered emphasized two tenets, to travel light and to meticulously plan ahead. Consequently, by the time January arrived, all my preparations had coalesced. I secured the essential permits and accoutrements, and my mother, in a show of unwavering support, pledged to dispatch replenishment parcels via general delivery to numerous post offices dotting the route. If I adhered to the timetable, my arrival was projected to coincide with the week following the package dispatch. Any superfluous items could be consigned to a supplementary container dispatched forward to a more distant waypoint. Beyond meticulous planning and groundwork, a crucial facet was to harbor realistic expectations. I harbored no ambitions of conquering the entirety of the 2,200-mile trail. My stratagem revolved around inaugurating the journey at Springer Mountain in Georgia, potentially extending as far as the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Should circumstances reveal my inadequacy or weariness, the option to terminate prematurely remained open. The aspiration of covering just under 500 miles meant that a scant two months would likely suffice for a full leg up to Virginia, neatly coinciding with the initiation of my new vocation at the close of May. Yet it wasn't merely the synchronization with my professional timeline that had aligned serendipitously. It felt as if all elements of the cosmos had conspired to facilitate this expedition propelling me towards its realization. And so, one early March day, adorned with my backpack, I secured my vehicle and commenced my sojourn. The inaugural day proved splendid. The climate maintained a pleasant coolness, the panoramas unfurled in breathtaking splendor, and an exhilarating enthusiasm coursed through my veins, spurred by the novelty of this distinct endeavor and the prospect of uncovering a fragment of the world that often slips from memory amidst the humdrum of urban existence. Though my distance covered on the first day amounted to a modest eight miles, my primary concern centered on my ability to set up camp. While I had practiced extensively, the chasm between rehearsing in one's backyard and applying the skills while weary and in genuine need loomed substantial. Nonetheless, I managed to erect my tent and kindle a fire. The satisfaction of consuming two packs of ramen was accentuated by the weariness that enveloped me. It wasn't long before I found myself succumbing to fatigue and seeking refuge within my sleeping bag, plummeting into a profound slumber. The subsequent morning greeted me with a chill that penetrated my bones and a stiffness that gnarled my muscles. It wasn't until afternoon that a semblance of normalcy returned. My novice's vigor and enthusiasm had waned yet so had the trepidation that initially accompanied me. Over a span of 24 hours, I encountered no significant adversities. If I could replicate this for perhaps another 48 instances, I would achieve my goal. This notion might appear trite, and in certain respects, it probably was. However, as the ensuing fortnight unfolded, I eased into the rhythmic cadence of the journey, finding solace in the restorative periods after establishing camp. The nocturnal hours occasionally wore an eerie shroud, framed by obsidian darkness and punctuated by peculiar echoes resonating from the enigma of night. Nonetheless, trepidation failed to seize me, slumber felt secure and inviting. This state of equilibrium persisted until the onset of the storm. I possessed waterproof attire, which indeed aided in maintaining a degree of dryness for both my backpack and garments. Nonetheless, its effectiveness was limited in preventing the rain from enveloping my face and trickling down my neck. By the time the second hour of the torrential downpour arrived, I discerned the initial squelches in my footwear, a forewarning that moisture was penetrating despite their waterproof nature. 
By the fourth hour, my feet had turned numb and chafed, prompting the realization that I urgently required shelter to recuperate and dry off for the day. The challenge extended beyond mere rainfall, however. The accompanying wind exacerbated the situation. While my tent had garnered favorable reviews and appeared to be holding its own, erecting it amidst a storm was uncharted territory. The feasibility of assembling it with the prevailing weather conditions was uncertain. Additionally, I lacked certainty about the structure's stability and its potential for remaining dry unless the conditions abated. Nevertheless, I was reluctant to push the limits of my endurance without affording my feet an opportunity to recover. Hence, I commenced searching for azure markers along the trail, signifying a promising campsite. It was during this pursuit that my attention was drawn to a wooden sign, indicating the presence of an Appalachian trail shelter a couple of hundred yards ahead. Adjacent to a blue blaze marker was another sign pointing to a side trail. Following this trail for half a mile, I discovered the shelter, a modest arrangement consisting of three wooden walls and a roof. A blue tarp was partially suspended along the outer edge, functioning as a makeshift fourth wall to repel some of the rain. My stomach churned slightly at the sight. Hitherto I had encountered and conversed with a few fellow hikers on the trail, but this marked my maiden venture into utilizing a shelter or confronting the prospect of sharing space or even sleeping in proximity to an unfamiliar individual. I reached into my pocket, my fingers brushing against the pocket knife, a small semblance of reassurance in case I were to encounter any potential threats. Still, I mustered a smile as I pushed aside the tarp, revealing an empty interior. No signs of human presence lingered, no belongings, and no damp patches suggestive of recent habitation amidst the rain. I scrutinized the tarp more closely. Its hue remained vivid, untouched by the sun, and its texture exhibited minimal wear. The question of why someone would abandon it after setting it up perplexed me, particularly if it had been arranged by a passing hiker. Regardless, gratitude welled up within me for the haven and solitude it offered. The ensuing moments were spent meticulously arranging my soaked possessions to dry and inspecting my feet, which, although aching, would likely recuperate given some respite from shoes and socks. Delving into my backpack, I located a bar for sustenance. In the event that the rain persisted, I forewent the notion of kindling a fire, relying on the abundance of water to see me through until morning, and prepared to sustain myself with dry rations. While I aspired to cover more ground, the encroaching darkness coupled with my heavy eyelids compelled me to reconsider. I settled in, attuned to the rhythmic drumming of rain upon the tarp and before long, succumbed to slumber. Hey, hey, hey there, you awake? The words disrupted my reverie, momentarily disorienting me about my surroundings and the ongoing situation. Gradually reorienting myself, I realized that the rain persisted accompanied by sporadic rustling of the blue tarp that constituted one of the shelter's walls. All was immersed in darkness, save for a countenance suspended above me in the obscurity, partially illuminated by the feeble glow of a diminutive lantern. Not meaning to intrude, just seeking refuge from the rain. Are you all right, Sharon? I gazed at the individual, uncertain of the appropriate response. On one hand, I wished to avoid discourtesy and the plight of leaving someone exposed to the rain. On the other hand, I was unfamiliar with the diminutive bearded gentleman. His origins were a mystery to me. Anticipating a continuous state of vigilance for the impending ten to twelve hours was something I dreaded. It appeared that he detected my lack of certainty and responded with a grin. I assure you I am amiable, he proclaimed. However, his smile wavered momentarily. I merely have an aversion to venturing into the obscurity where the engulfing darkness resides. I signaled my agreement with a nod. Indeed, proceed. There exists an abundance of space. And truthfully, there was ample room. The area could comfortably accommodate eight or even ten individuals provided they sat closely. In the existing arrangement, even though we were situated a considerable distance apart, we needed to elevate our voices to overcome the cacophonous rain. He engaged in conversation as he extracted various provisions, introducing himself as Tony. He went the extra mile, extending an invitation to employ his petite portable stove for the purpose of heating one of my meals. The scenario was peculiar. On the surface, he exuded affability and a general nonchalance, yet an underlying jitteriness was unmistakably concealed. 
Initially, I pondered whether his unease around strangers mirrored my own social discomfort. Thus, I deemed it appropriate to afford him solitude until slumber beckoned for us both. However, he resumed his dialogue once again. His voice, rough and thin, stood in contrast to the steady drumming of the rain. Is this your inaugural expedition on the trail? I emitted an awkward laugh. Is my inexperience so overt? His smile materialized, accompanied by a nonchalant shrug. Nay, or perhaps yes, the novelty is apparent. Those new to the endeavor invariably emit a certain aura, as if they've stumbled upon an exclusive enigma. His smile dimmed somewhat, followed by a contemplative expression. Which, in essence, they have, he remarked. I affirmed with a nod. Certainly there are moments of intimidation. Nevertheless, I derive considerable satisfaction from this undertaking. I find myself proud of this accomplishment. I gestured towards Tony. What about you? After all this time, you must retain a fondness for the pursuit. He chuckled, his gaze momentarily darting towards the tarp as a distant branch snapped. Indeed, that is correct. I do possess an attachment. This marks my third traverse, this time through Ike. The initial journey was southbound, commencing in the frostiest segment of the year. I deluded myself into believing I was up to the challenge, he admitted, exhaling deeply as he shook his head. In retrospect, that was folly. I should have exercised patience and commenced at a more opportune juncture. His lips formed a tight line. Chances are circumstances would have been more favorable. My brows furrowed. Well, from where I stand, you seem to be managing well. And if you're bound for Springer, a mere few days should see you through. His gaze returned to the tarp. Perhaps, he replied, then redirected his eyes to me. Listen, what I'm about to disclose may sound nonsensical, but if you've heard anything peculiar during the nighttime hours, particularly these past few nights, I mean, I know that nocturnal sounds can be bizarre. Trees creaking, birds and other creatures producing enigmatic noises. Some of it I can discern, but frequently I'm at a loss. I chuckled. You'll have to provide a more precise description. My acquaintance with such oddities is rather extensive. He absently rubbed the backs of his knees, managing a faint smile as he nodded. Of course, indeed, it's... Tony hesitated before continuing. It's akin to the wail of an infant. An unsettling sensation tingled in my stomach. However, I compelled another smile. This does indeed resemble a tale suitable for sharing around a campfire. I motioned towards his modest butane stove. But I dare say that contraption doesn't quite qualify as a campfire. My gaze shifted upwards, meeting his intense stare. Our small lanterns cast twin glows in the darkness as his expression oscillated between seriousness and something altogether peculiar. This is no mere story, Carson. It's genuine. I heard it just two nights ago. I made a conscious effort to maintain my gaze locked with his somber eyes. All right, Tony, it seems you have more to reveal. Please enlighten me with the particulars. Over the course of three decades, my hikes have extended beyond this trail, encompassing diverse landscapes. In my younger years, I served as a guide out west for several summers. My point is, I've encountered numerous instances of peculiarity over time. I've heard an array of anecdotes, much like the one you're sharing now. Never before have I been swayed by such tales. The only element of nature that evokes fear is ignorance. To this day, no phenomenon has defied logical explanation for me. Even the most uncanny occurrences can typically be attributed to natural sources, be it the cry of a baby, which in some cases resembles the vocalizations of bobcats or certain varieties of owls. Hence, embrace the idea of porcupines if you hold it within your belief system. Yet, if you possess the knowledge of what auditory signals to attend to, you can discern the contrast. That distinction is precisely what I was attuned to capture. When the commencement of weeping reached my ears two nights prior, I happened to be traversing after sunset, not the wisest choice for one of limited experience, though I was well acquainted with the terrain. My awareness informed me that a superb location for camping was only a few miles ahead. This diminutive portable cooking apparatus exerts substantial weight. Many individuals would argue that its inclusion signifies a novice's blunder. Nevertheless, it facilitates my arrival at the destination sans the need to engage in the ordeal of kindling a fire, should I opt not to. 
On numerous pleasant evenings I forgo the unpacking of my tent altogether. I meander through the moonlit expanse until fatigue beckons me to rest. Subsequently I settle down, warm sustenance over the stove, and retire beneath the celestial canopy. These ruminations occupied my thoughts while I progressed toward that specific area on the creek's fringe. It wound its course downwards, culminating in a waterfall sufficiently proximate to serenade one into slumber. That's when the lamentation began. Could it be a bobcat, perhaps? No, the tones were too meticulously modulated and crystal clear for such an attribution. Furthermore, there was an unanticipated warmth to the sound. Initially, my curiosity was piqued. However, as the lamentation resurfaced, a burgeoning sense of apprehension took root at the recesses of my mind. The sound was unmistakably that of an infant, a living, breathing human infant, left to wail amid these wooded environs. Conceivably, the progenitors were incapacitated or had forsaken their offspring. Regardless, the infant was imperiled, experiencing agony or distress. It necessitated intervention. This imperative transformed into an undeniable mandate. Thus, I deviated from the trail, forging my path through the thicket, restraining the impulse to break into a sprint. Swiftness was imperative, yet a sprained ankle or fractured limb would render me incapable of rendering aid. Besides, the probability of securing a cellular signal at such a remote locale was far from guaranteed. Thus, I paced myself, adroitly navigating between trees and shrubbery, ascending and descending hillsides. The infant's cries persisted, acting as my compass, guiding me closer, closer until I stood in its midst. An expanse of winter trees, bereft of their expected foliage, greeted my sight. A fleeting thought brushed the periphery of my mind. Were these arboreal forms deceased? However, a sudden gust of wind swayed their lithe branches, cutting through my contemplations. The infant's cries enveloped me, borne upon the wind akin to a clutch of crimson leaves, foretelling danger, or perhaps worse, the aftermath of peril. A shudder coursed through me as I scanned the obscurity, seeking the origin of the infant's anguish. Initially, my search yielded not. Yet an epiphany dawned, prompting me to cast my gaze upwards, toward the nearest tree. A pair of luminous yellow eyes greeted my gaze, unflinching and unwavering. My initial assumption veered toward error. The source was, in fact, a bobcat. However, upon closer scrutiny, it became evident that these eyes were aberrant, too expansive, their distance apart, conspicuously deviant. The eyes initiated their motion through the obscurity, progressing toward the tree's trunk before descending groundward. It was then that I aimed my flashlight, thus igniting the sequence of my shriek. In certain aspects it resembled a child, albeit not an infant, but rather a youth of around twelve, gauging by stature and limb proportions. Yet its integument exuded the texture of arid reptilian hide, or the very bark of a tree. As it descended, the skin exhibited a curious fluidity, akin to mimicry of its surroundings. Its digits, elongated and spindly, terminated in broad pads, each adorned with barbed talons that sprouted like punitive implements. Its countenance, however, plunged into the abyss of obscurity, dominated solely by those infernal yellow orbs. Allow me to emphasize the gravity of my assertion. It's not that its head was obscured from view. Quite the opposite. I perceived it with utmost clarity as it drew closer, crawling in my direction. I implore you to grasp this fact. It possessed no head whatsoever. Those luminous orbs, shrouded in the abyss, held sway over the space where a head should rightfully reside. And from this abyss, an eerie resonance emerged, akin to a dolorous whale's lament, ensnaring me within its grasp terror coursing through my veins. Even as terror held me captive, I bore witness to its excavation of the earth, inching closer with each passing moment. Resisting the urge to yield to that desperate plea proved to be a formidable challenge. It's uncertain if I could have maintained my resistance at all, had I not become so entangled and fixated on peering into that abyssal void it referred to as its countenance. Strangely within that void, I discerned the presence of teeth, countless teeth that shattered the enchantment that held me captive, permitting a surge of panic to propel me into flight. Instinct guided me toward the direction of the path, and it didn't take long for me to retrace my steps. I veered onto the trail, hastening my pace while simultaneously extracting my phone, aiming to summon assistance. Yet, as previously mentioned, the signal remained elusive. 
Gazing back, no trace of the entity pursuing me materialized. Even if there were auditory indications of its pursuit emanating from the adjacent woods, they remained obscured by the cadence of my breath as I endeavored to increase the distance, vigilant against stumbling. The fear of not merely injury, but of an imminent attack kept me upright. I nursed the notion that a fall would result in an instantaneous assault, its dreadful maw, which defied its classification as a mouth, tearing into me, subsequently dragging me back into the enigmatic depths of the woods. Consequently, I traversed through the night, and the entity never again manifested itself. By early afternoon the subsequent day, my stamina waned to the point of exhaustion, compelling me to rest before collapsing. In my state of near delirium, I entertained the notion that the entire ordeal was a product of fevered dreams or perhaps an incipient illness. At the very least, it seemed prudent to decelerate and convalesce for a span of days. Such embryonic thoughts remained latent within my mind. Upon rousing a few hours past sundown, I discerned that my sleeping bag had been unfastened, and an inexplicable sensation graced my skin, a touch, a caress. My heart pounded erratically as I cautiously adjusted my head to survey my extremities. The luminescence of its eyes illuminated my lower limbs, exposing a vibrant purple tongue unfurling from the obscurity encased in that luminous aura. This time an outline of a visage seemed almost perceptible, a contorted and aberrant countenance that fluidly morphed. My certainty wavered, but my focus centered more upon its actions. I was being licked, a sensation just behind my knee. The instinctual response of a scream propelled me into a roll away from the perceived threat, convinced that imminence of attack was inescapable. Yet, the anticipated assault did not materialize. As I regained my footing, it had once again vanished. Its reappearance remains elusive to this day. While I am inclined to attribute this entire episode to an exuberant imagination, I resist such a conclusion. Self-awareness dismisses my propensity for fantastical notions. Moreover, the area that received its peculiar caress continues to bear witness, unchanged in appearance yet indelibly imprinted, as if I've been marked in some unfathomable manner. Thunderclaps reverberated, momentarily startling Tony, who redirected his gaze across the distance to me. This narrative likely appears implausible. Skepticism likely thrives within you, regarding my integrity or my mental state. I perceived the mounting tension as Tony recounted his tale, apprehension coalescing around both the narrative itself and the potential for his mental instability, even possible peril. Inexplicably, as his account ceased, I found myself eschewing outbursts or entreaties for his departure, alternatives that might have relieved the burgeoning pressure within me. Instead, I posed a query, my voice preserving a veneer of composure. Why did you choose to share this with me? Tony wiped his lips, offering a sobering response. To offer you warning. Additionally, I am uncertain to what lengths it might journey in pursuit of me. For in my estimation, the culmination is far from reached. His gaze flickered to the nearby tarp. I believe it still hunts me. Shaking my head, I acknowledged, Well, that's certainly an extraordinary tale. To be candid, I do harbor reservations about your mental state. My intent isn't to antagonize, but to be forthright. He nodded, understanding my perspective. I comprehend your perspective. Yet I implore you, allow me refuge within. I am paralyzed by dread at the prospect of venturing into the unknown. I shall depart at the break of dawn, I promise. A furrow formed on my brow. My friend, if fear has taken its hold on you to such an extent, may I ask why? Why did you not set forth on your journey today or even earlier? By the heavens, I had vanished subsequent to that initial night when I witnessed that entity descending the tree. The expression on his countenance seized my breath and constricted my chest. I had pondered the same query. Initially, I attempted to convince myself it was a mere fabrication of my mind. Following last night's occurrence, I continued to reassure myself that I merely needed to persevere until I reached a settlement where, regrettably, cellular service is non-existent. He let out a bitter laugh. The predicament, however, lies in the fact that I have not examined my phone for a span of two days, not since I re-encountered the trail two nights ago. He averted his gaze from mine. I hold the belief that it will no longer permit me to depart, exhaling a gradual breath as he spoke. I brushed my fingers against the blade in my pocket once more, 
Very well, my thoughts are in disarray. Nonetheless, I can perceive the depth of your trepidation. Remain on your side and equilibrium shall prevail. Agreed. He vigorously nodded. I perceived a shimmer that resembled teardrops in his eyes. I extend my gratitude. Profound gratitude, my friend. I shall refrain from imposing for Nothing definite came to mind as a response. I merely nodded and reclined against the wall. I recognized that having him within was a condition I could not reconcile with slumber. The impact on my overarching scheme was uncertain. At present, my primary aspiration was for Tony to have vanished by the time I awoke. The illumination of my lantern was waning, yet the pale light of early morn penetrated the tarp adequately, revealing his backpack and bedroll. Yet the man himself was conspicuously absent. An instant of panic coursed through me, compelling me to inspect my own belongings. All remained intact. Peering along the edge of the tarp, I found no trace of him whatsoever. I was on the verge of withdrawing my head when I detected the imprints in the mud. My throat constricted. I rose and stepped outside. A series of footprints led away from Tony's designated area within the shelter. The rain must have ceased around the time of his departure, for his footsteps were distinctly outlined. They advanced toward the periphery of the clearing before being abruptly obliterated by a swath of mud that morphed into a trail extending into the woods. I yearned to venture farther to locate him and ensure his well-being. Yet I lacked the resolve to do so, for I comprehended the nature of those additional marks. They were impressions created by dragging. An entity had seized that man and dragged him away during my slumber. Upon retrieving my phone, I promptly established a connection. Two hours later, I had secured transportation to the nearest town. That afternoon, I boarded a bus bound for my home. I confided in my kin and companions about the affliction in my stomach, attributing it to a stomach bug or the aftermath of tainted sustenance. This caused me to abandon my original plans to honor my father's memory, assuring them that I would find an alternative approach. Yet I withheld from them the tale of the individual I encountered and the unsettling occurrences witnessed in the obscurity. Even until the preceding night, uncertainty clouded my beliefs. I could have easily convinced myself that Tony had merely succumbed to hallucinogenic mushrooms and strayed into the forest to sleep off the effects. Reintegrating into reality, the presence of illumination and people fostered the inclination to treat the entire episode as an uncanny escapade or a dream that had left an impression. I have now transitioned into my fresh abode. Despite the steep rent and paper-thin walls, I find solace in sensing the pulsating vitality of humanity around me. This sense of connection is consoling, not solely due to its alleviation of loneliness, but also because it imparts a feeling of security. Nevertheless, vexations are not absent. When roused from slumber by the recurring cries of the neighboring child, I had to marshal self-control opting to quench my frustration and temper rather than confront them aggressively. As I endeavored to remain undisturbed, I swung my feet onto the floor, rising to a standing position, all the while questioning the source of an unfamiliar yellow radiance. The world lurched forward as a coarse and elastic entity ensnared my calves, tugging me backward, causing me to sprawl on the floor. A moment of dread ensued before I was abruptly dragged under the bed, casting aside rational notions. I found myself scrabbling at the floor and emitting screams, engaged in a struggle against the entity lurking beneath the bed's confines, relentlessly pulling me in. Its strength was overwhelming, forcing me onto my stomach as it settled its weight upon the small of my back. A pause ensued, marked by stillness and contemplation. Subsequently, the entity tore open the fabric of my sweatpants on the left leg, just behind the knee. A howl escaped my lips as its rough appendage, akin to a serpent's tail, slithered across my skin before vanishing. Shortly thereafter, the weight on my back dissipated, and the sound of shattering glass from the living room window signified its departure into the night. I wish I could console myself by labeling this as another dream. Yet the shattered glass demanded my attention, as did the need to change out of my ruined attire. Gazing into the mirror, terror stared back at me, dispelling any illusion. I am indelibly marked, a sensation clinging to me akin to ingrained filth. I wish to believe I can evade or confront its return, but a lingering suspicion arises from the knowledge of how it departed the apartment the previous night. 
More intriguingly, I comprehend its mode of entry when I ventured into the living room to ensure its absence, discovering the shattered window. My front door captured my attention. I can't recall with clarity, but I surmise that in my somnolence, I might have unlatched it, propelled by a compulsion to investigate an odd noise from outside, or perhaps to welcome in an enigmatic companion I had forged a bond with within the heart of the woods.